folks, it is time for our annual uh, 4th of July UFC card. Even though it's not technically 4th of July, it's actually after it. But, you know, they do that, you know, every time this year. It's kind of like a, the MMA equivalent of the old WCW Beach Blast shows. Remember that? Except instead of being at a beach, it's actually in an NHL arena. Well, anyway, for the second year in a row, we've got Amanda Nunez headlining the show. And she's taking on Valentina Shevchenko. And these two have fought before. I, I believe Nunez got a union institution victory out of that one. And, uh, yeah, it's a little bit different from the last couple of Nunez fights because she destroyed Ronda Rousey on her feet. She just carved up Misha Tate. So, you know, having a fight go full 15 minutes certainly is a different kind of uh, fight for the champion who's defending going into this equation. So I went back, and I didn't watch the whole fight, but I watched the highlights. And I think this one will play out very, very similarly to the last one. I don't think Nunez is going to go in there and uh, knock out Shevchenko. I don't think he's going to submit her either. I think that's not going to happen. But I do think she'll control the tempo. I think the first two rounds will be pretty competitive. You know, there might be a scenario where Shevchenko might go in there and stick to her jab in the game and she actually wins a round or two. But I think the longer this fight drags on, I think Nunez has really, really good cardio. And if she can control the ground game, which I think she could, I mean, just look at that. Takedowns are pretty uh, considerable there. Very, very good, actually. Very, very even-handed custody contest here. Then I think she can roll. I think she can get the last three rounds and wreck those up pretty easy. And move on her merry way. But like I said, though, I think Valentino, she is going to make this competitive. This will not be a walk in the park. I think it goes a full 25 minutes. Uh, but I think Nunez, she'll control with the jab. She'll set that up for the final three rounds, two rounds, definitely, to make it a ground battle. And this guy, more faith in Nunez, I think she's a better overall fighter. But Valentino, like I said, she will make it competitive. This will not be a walk in the park. This will not be a, you know an absolute mauling like the last couple of fights. And that's really good for, I think, women's MMA because we need some competitive matchups. We can't just keep having... You know, uh, Joanna Champion just slaying dudes, or, uh, you know, Nunez going there being uncontested. You know, uh, having a little bit of uh, competition in the divisions is a good thing. And it'll go a long way in making this a sustainable operation and really sort of vaunting the value of the women's division overall, especially without Ronda Rousey or Misha Tate or any of these other people, you know, that are marketable in the equation. So all that to say, Nunez, unanimous decision. Controversial, I know. For the interim middleweight championship, because good lord, we don't have enough interim championships in the UFC nowadays. Yoel Romero taking on Robert Whitaker. Um, who wins is going to be fighting Michael Bisping. Probably at some point for the years over for the real title. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if UFC, especially if Robert Whitaker wins, they don't put this like in Wembley Stadium or something. Just go really all out and have like a huge, huge outdoor show. Let me do something in Australia. I mean, New Zealand's got to have a really big cricket ground somewhere. They might do that, too. But then again, Yoel Romero, he's a tough dude. We saw him, you know, uh, knee Chris Wideman's head off a couple of uh, cards ago. So he can do it. I mean, he can definitely, uh, you know, bring the pain early and often. So let's look at the stats here. Really, really, even as far as the biological metrics here. Same height, same reach advantage. So that's kind of a wash. Uh, Whitaker is landing more shots per minute, and he's also absorbing more shots, so that, that's pretty interesting, too. Defense, pretty much average. Romero, better takedown. Even though Whitaker has better takedown accuracy and better takedown defense, submission is not going to be a factor in this fight. I don't think it's going to go to a decision. I don't see that going the full 25 minutes. I mean, interim title shots, uh, or title matches, they are a full 25 minutes, right? Okay, yeah, they are. Okay, I had to double check that one. Yes, I can go full 25 minutes. I think Romero, his big problem is he doesn't have a gas tank. And Whitaker, as long as he can sort of minimize the damage he incurs in rounds one and two, I think he can go in there and just kind of crank up the juice in the third round. And I see him going out there, and I think he defeats Yoel Romero by TKO either late in the fourth or early in the fifth. So Whitaker, he wins the interim title. He's got a day with Michael Bisping, and it'll be a huge extravagant event. Uh, somewhere later down the road. They may not even have it, you know, this year. They might try to delay it until 2018 and get a 
big stadium show together, but I'm going to go with Whitaker to win this one. Late stoppage. Daniel Pollock taking on Curtis Blades. Not Shondo Blades from that one ABC reality TV show. Remember that one from a couple summers ago? I forgot what it was called. It was like The Quest or something really ridiculous like that. And there was an MMA fighter. I know way too much about that. This is way too obscure for me to be into, even for this particular channel. So, yeah, both these guys doing pretty well for themselves. I think this is one of Curtis Blades' most, uh, well, probably his, I don't know if it's his first fight in the UFC, but it's certainly one of his first fights in the UFC if it isn't his debut. Uh, Daniel O has been fighting uh, forever. He's got, like, what, almost 30 fights under his belt. I'm not really sure how long he's been in the UFC either, but he's ranked 15, so he's done something. So, what do I expect? This one is uh, pretty interesting. Uh, high weight advantage goes towards Curtis. Reach advantage. Huge advantage for Curtis. It's almost a good six inches. Leg reach goes towards Blades. Look at the significant strikes here. Uh, pretty even killed. Here's the difference. Look at this right here. Grappling. For Daniel O at 0.65 per fight compared to 9.78 for Curse Blades. That is absolutely preposterous. Uh, so yeah, in a heavyweight battle, if you control on the ground, that's way, 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 way important in sort of guiding you towards a victory. So based on that metric alone, I'm going to go Curse Blades to win this one. I'm not really sure how he's going to win it. I don't think this fight lasts long, but I think uh, Blades gets him down early and he knocks him off. I have a early second round TKO stoppage for Blades, just based on that metric alone. That's that's a good one. Fabricio Verdum taking on Alistair Overeem. Now, these guys have fought twice before. The fight in Strike Force was one of the worst things I have ever seen in my entire life, so I have very, very low expectations for this one. Um, what do you need to know? Uh, Fabricio does not want to strike with Overeem. Overeem does not want to grapple with Verdun. So we're going to play this ridiculously conservative. We're not going to take any risks here. I think we see some really crappy trading into the cage. Fabricio probably going to try to minimize that by making it a close fight up against the cage. Overeem, you know, he might try to do some grappling. I mean, it wouldn't really surprise me. Um, I think Verdun is the better overall ground fighter, though. But I think uh, Overeem's going to get more points. Yeah, Overeem's going to win this by year's decision. I'm not going to get into the metrics. And it's going to be one of the worst fights of the year. And uh, I guess that puts him back in line for title shot against Stipe Miocic. So hopefully we get to watch him get knocked silly again. All right, Anthony Pettis taking on Jim Miller. Anthony Pettis really has fallen from grace. He's lost like three of his last four matches, I think, in the UFC. On a downward trajectory. Jim Miller kind of doing a miniature career resurgence. Um, I'm not going to bore you with the metric. It looks like it favors Pettis as far as just the physical stats. Fighting stats, pretty comparable. Uh, it looks like Jim Miller is a better wrestler. You know what? Every time we do a show around the 4th of July, there's always like that one like monumental upset that happens. Like you had uh, Melvin Guillard getting choked out by... Uh, Joe Lozon one year. I mean, he had Tito Ortiz choking out Ryan Bader out of the blue a couple years back. Uh, so with all that in mind, you know what? I'm going to go for the upset. I think Jim Miller's going to win this fight. I think he's going to win by a second round submission. He goes in there, he gets a guillotine choke, and uh, Pettis, next thing you know, he's going to be fighting Bellator. So there you go, two predictions. Miller with the upset by submission. Pettis, final match in the UFC, goes to Bellator. We'll see what happens. Uh, but yeah, if we're basing this based on Bulge alone, I think he's going to win this one. You can literally see his genitals in this, this picture. That's, that's risque. All right, so very, very quickly, I'm going to go over uh, the prelims and uh, the five pass fights. Uh, Mr. Travis, uh, Mr. Ronda Rousey, Travis Brown, more uh, likely nicknamed Hapa. Isn't that like some sort of like uh, racial term to mean like you're half Asian and half Caucasian? Because, I don't know, apparently if you're half Asian and your mom is half white or whatever, the inverse, you're more like a big version of Johnny Hendrix. And, uh, yeah, that was, that was not really a good joke, but whatever. So Travis Brown not really winning a whole lot of fights. He's got a lot of diversions. He's out with crazy old Ronda Rousey being crazy together. Just went for that to become a domestic violence uh, 
crisis in the making. Digging on Alexi Olaniac, the boa constrictor. I'm not going to favor Travis Brown in a lot of fights, but I think he wins this fight. It's just not good. I think uh, Olaniac is way, way older, too, and uh, the stats definitely against him. Travis Brown goes in there. He wins a unanimous decision. Should be pretty, pretty boring. Uh, Chad Laprise taking on Brian Camozzi. Brian Camozzi has been fighting UFC forever. Um, strikes landed per minute. I'm going to go with Laprise just based on the uh, striking stats there. I think he wins uh, late third round stoppage TKO. Diego Santos still fighting, taking on Gerald Mearshart, GM3. Um, I'm going to go with Santos to win this one by Guinness decision. Nothing will jump out at me right there. Uh, Jordan Mine taking on Bilal Mohammed. Um, yeah, I'm going to go with Jordan Mine to win this one by second round TKO. I mean, he gets that pretty easy. Rob Font taking on Douglas Silva de Andrade because just put all the Portuguese names in there, why don't you? He's only lost one fight, so it's actually a pretty good little matchup here considering it's on Facebook or whatever if you're putting this crap on. I'm going to go with uh, Douglas Silva to win this one. I think he wins by second round TKO, just based on the stats here. And of course we got the people who don't even have pictures because those are the fights you really care about. Cody Stammen taking on Terry and Ware. You know, this actually could be um, women fighting. I'm not, well, actually it's not, because I have to see a lot of men. I uh, don't really care. I don't really know much about these guys making an informed decision one way or another. They have stats listed, so I'm just going by complete nonsense here. I'm going to go with Stammen because he has a better win record. That's it. That's all I can do for a fight like this. Uh, we got Trevin Giles taking on James Bochnevik. Uh, looks pretty good. These are look like they're pretty talented up and comers. Once again, though, I have nothing to work with here. No stats, so I can only go by the win loss record. I'm gonna go with uh, Giles Sand defeated. He went by unanimous decision. And uh, actually, they have look at this. They have Giles taking on Bonchnish twice. So it's actually a uh, back to back. First time ever in UFC history. We're gonna have two guys fight each other back to back. So I guess it's best out of two. Wow. Really good business making right there. All right, so all I have to say, it's probably not the best 4th of July show we've had, but we got some interesting matchups. I mean, I think there should be at least maybe two or three fairly competitive, interesting matchups in the main card in the prelims, and that probably makes it going anyway to visit. So let's get through this one. We got UFC 2014, probably the biggest show all year happening. And from there, we got Mayweather McGregor. We got some good boxing matches coming up. We've got Another MSG show in November, so hopefully we got a lot of really, really good stacked top-to-bottom MMA cards coming up in the future, and this is the beginning. So we'll be there, I'll see you cage side, and I'll be making picks in a couple of weeks. So feel free to take these to the bank, don't use them, do whatever you want. It's a free country. A free country as long as you live in America. Don't forget that. Mm -hmm.